All right, it is live, everybody. Another week, another training. Uh, so we didn't have yesterday as we typically would. Not a big deal, hopefully. Um, I will do the best I can with the chat. We're spread pretty thin right now, so I don't have somebody helping me monitor the chat like normal. So I'd appreciate some patience there. Just uh, if you can, whether it's capitalize, however you can, make it as obvious as you can to me in the chat. That'll help me kind of identify it as I do go through here. Ultimately, I do have a decent amount. I want to dive into some basic troubleshooting, and then I'm going to talk about some startup stuff as well in this process. So why don't we start with uh, some basic troubleshooting uh, principles with cooling towers. First of all, one of the main things you have to think about is you're actually doing a a building troubleshoot many times when you're dealing with a cooling tower troubleshoot because so much of what happens in the cooling tower is happening on a building wide basis. So it's not like, you know, if you have a regular water source heat pump, for example, or say you've got a self contained or a, a scud unit, as, as some people refer to it, whatever the case may be, many, many times you're actually able to really localize your troubleshoot to that system and you don't have to go very far outside of it in most situations. With a cooling tower though, it is very common that you're gonna end up having to evaluate a more broad scale perspective, but that doesn't mean that there aren't some basic things that you can verify at the tower level uh, just to get yourself started. So for example, probably the four most common, this is not you know, an all inclusive, but the four most common are gonna be like a high water temperature uh, condition, having a troubleshoot through that or a high water level. Those, those two, I think specifically are the biggest issues we deal with. A third pretty close rival to those would be a low water level. And then on the, uh, on the, the lesser common side of it would be a, um, uh, a low water temperature issue, which is more of a controls problem at the end of the day. So let's dive into uh, the startup itself. I'm just going to cover this fairly briefly. There's not there's not a just one size fit for this because there's a, there's three main types that we see in our area here in Central Texas, uh, and really specifically, there's two really like legitimate main types. Uh, which are a counter flow and then we have a cross flow or horizontal flow whatever the actual term is for it uh, which there are several of those in existence but they're not as common my part of my point though is there's not a one size fit for just every tower so i'm going to try to do my best to cover as much as i can in each specific one's details ultimately a counter flow is the general standard tower we see uh, where we're pulling air in, we're pushing it out through a fan assembly, and we're just cycling water through this basin or a cross flow. Uh, we may have a long, narrow tower, so we may pull air in, and, and uh, let's see, many of these will pull air in from the top, or we'll pull it in from maybe the side, and then we will uh, go through our fill and then we'll have a fan. Uh, the ones we have typically have some kind of a squirrel cage uh, or blower fan that's going to pull the air through and eject it out the side instead of a top draft. Uh, you could see either or, and actually uh, this would be a draw through style. I've also seen them uh, thinking of one building in particular where the fan actually pushes up through. Uh, I don't, this would, I don't remember the exact term for this offhand, uh, but as the fan's actually pushing through the tower and then up through the basin, you'll have like a little access port here on the side. And this is pressurized. So if you open this hatch, you'll have like a little four prong thing on it. If you open this hatch while the fan is running, it's just going to blast you with water and air because it's going to be just forcing so much of it to that point. So something to be careful with. Either way, vast majority of the time, we're looking at a counter flow. There's not as many of these. These principles we're gonna talk about will cover everything uh, or cover both styles. Um, there's other examples out there in the world. I'm not gonna talk about every single one of them today. I'm just gonna speak towards the ones that we actually very commonly have to address. So 
with our counter flow style fans or style towers, there's two main types that we still deal with. There is a, um, there's a open loop style, which I'll use this as an example. And then we have a closed loop style. Now the closed loops, uh, there's benefits to both. We'll get into that. Uh, but the closed loops are the ones that had routine failures over these last couple of winters when we had all the hard freezes because of the bundle that's in them. And so that's part of what makes them a closed loop is you'll have a set of pipes sticking out the side. Uh, and these pipes will be connected to a, a water bundle. That's not the most accurate representation. Let me try that again. It'll be connected to a water bundle that'll come in and it just makes a whole bunch of use very similar to uh, a regular coil. And you'll have a set of headers, but you'll also have on the side of the tower, you say, here's your basin, here's your water level. You'll have a basin pump uh, or a fill pump that is going to run water out of the basin up to a top uh, fill deck or a sprayer deck, you know, to kind of depend on what, what specific style you have. And this is going to spray water down across this. And so we're cycling water here inside of the tower. So this water that's in the basin on a closed loop style stays in the basin. But the water that's in the bundle, this is the actual water that cycles through the building. Where on the open loop, our building water will come into the top of the basin uh, and then our uh, basin water in the bottom is going back out to the building. So uh, that is your, let's see, this should be in and out, something like that. This is your basic uh, flow between open loop and closed loop. So that's the big things to keep in mind. This is open, uh, the loop water, this water you see, I mean, is actually flowing through the building. So any kind of contaminants, anything that gets into this water is gonna be able to get into the building. Whereas with this style, with the closed loop, its benefits is the water that's in the basin never introduces to the building loop water. So as long as we don't have any leaks in our building loop, we shouldn't have issues with consistently losing water in there and it can be treated accordingly. Um, now, these are less efficient because we're having to exchange through another medium, but they can save in maintenance costs because we're not having to worry about pushing any trash or particulates into our building, uh, which, is, which is where they really kind of own their spot. Now, what we have to be careful with is all this standing water in here is really easy to freeze and bust. Now, in terms of startup, there's a few primary things you have to really think about. Towers are fairly simple at the end of the day. Uh, we may or may not have a control panel. So if we, if we don't have a control panel, for example, then we're going to be talking about um, we have a basin heater that's going to have just a line thermostat. Uh, so we're going to have a, usually a 120 or 240 circuit, whatever it may be, 208 maybe, uh, going to a thermostat which then will tie into our basin heater. So it's just going to receive power. When the thermostat closes, it's going to energize the heater based off of the basin temperature. So typically we want that basin to stay above, uh, I usually set those somewhere between 45 and 50, 55 degrees. Uh, you can set them lower, but you want to be really careful with setting them too low because you want that heater to come in and try to start keeping that water warm well before it gets to the freezing point. So if you allow it to go ahead and drop down into the 30s, for example, especially if you're not using an economizer loop, I'll explain more on that later, but if, you're, uh, if you let it drop into the 30s, you're adding that much more that the, the heater then has to try to overcome to keep that temperature back away from freezing. That's really what, that's the whole point of the basin heater. The basin heater is there to prevent the water in the basin from freezing over. Um, so if with, with a system that has non, that does not have actual onboard controls, so we uh, feed power to the basin heater, 
we're going to feed power to our uh, fan motor as well. So that can come through uh, uh, even one that doesn't have onboard controls. It can still have a drive that's remote. And our building automation system is going to be feeding that drive directly to, uh, to control that fan speed. They, the fans can be set on starters, but honestly, there are not very many towers still in, it's still in existence today where we run the fans off of starters. The, 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 almost all of them that I see on a routine basis have been converted at this point. Not all. Now, there is a high and low speed. Ultimately, what that is is the motor has uh, two sets of windings in it. So it's a two-stage motor, if you will. So we feed power to one set of terminals, which gives us our low speed. Um, and then we feed power to a separate set of terminals, which gives us our high speed rotation. That's still a fairly common thing. Um, but uh, as you see new towers coming out, just everything's going with a VFD base. So I would highly encourage you to start learning that. Now, we'll get into more of the specifics on why that drive is doing what it's doing later. But either way, you're going to have one or the other. You'll either have a starter contact of some kind and maybe a high-low. Now, uh, with a high-low panel like that, you're typically going to have a um, uh, some kind of control panel. So in this particular case, we're talking about a tower that does not have a control panel. Uh, you could have a remote starter or a, uh, a VFD still, either way. So you just you got to give the, the fan motor power somehow, whether we control speed or not. Taking that a step further, uh, you should have some kind of uh, level control. Typically, you that in a, in a uh, non-controlled tower is going to be just a fill valve with a with a float on the end of a ball. So it's quite literally as simple as it sounds. You'll have a valve over here coming into the side of the tower. It's just going to be a down dump with a little armature sticking out and a big old, uh, typically copper uh, ball on the end of it. So as the level comes up, that ball pushes the armature in, which seals the valve, stopping it from flowing. When the uh, level in the tower begins to reduce, which it's going to do because we're using evaporative cooling. So part of your cooling tower 101s, we have an evaporative cooler. And this evaporative cooler is allowing us to cool the water. Well, part of evaporation means that our liquid is now turning to a gas. And so we have to replenish that liquid every so often. So as this float drops, uh, it allows this, um, uh, the, the valve in here to open and we're gonna refill that water back up to uh, that closing point. Uh, so we need water there. And typically, you, you're just gonna pull that straight from tap. Now the chemical treatment people, they will then uh, connect somewhere to that basin and they will have their own, you know, they have a chem station. That's a totally separate deal. And for us as mechanical, we typically don't have to worry about that. That usually ends up being somebody else's responsibility. Um, our focus is we need to get fresh water to the tower so that we can keep that basin at a proper level. And that is true whether it's closed loop or open loop because our basin level becomes what's important there. And then if you have a closed loop, one thing that's in addition to that is you need to make sure you're, you're powering uh, your fill pump or your basin pump specifically. And that's going to be separate from the building pumps. And in, in none of these examples am I uh, referencing the pumps that move the water through the building. I'm specifically referencing the pumps that move the water through the tower. Now on an open loop, it is still very common that you're going to have the building loop is going to be the, the same pump or the, the building pump is going to be the same one that feeds through the open loop tower. And in some cases, you can have like a primary secondary where uh, one set of pumps is pushing it through the building, another set is uh, getting our tower flow, but that's not always the case. And that's really the biggest things. You know, if we can, if we can make the fan motor run, we can power the basin heater, 
and we can, uh, if we have a basin pump, make that function. And we got to get water flow, obviously, through the through the tower itself. So this is where balancing and things come into play. So a lot of the times uh, we are with well, the closed loop is fairly straightforward. This basin pump and this circulation, as long as everything's in good condition, there's not really any balancing on the basin water that you have to really do. It pretty well handles itself. You do have to balance your pressure differential across your bundles. But many times, uh, as a starting point, if you can just start with them full open, and if you balance the rest of the building, you don't actually need to really do anything with these valves here. Any valves on the, the bundle for the tower turn into uh, just general isolation valves uh, on their own. They don't need any additional balancing. The building flow takes care of the GPM that this tower needs to be effective. So that's that's that that's where this isn't the tower's issue if there is a if there is a flow problem. Now on the other hand, with a open loop, you'll have a set of uh, decks that we call them hot decks. And so let me clean this up a little bit here. So this is our basin line. Make sure y'all can see. Yeah. And we'll have a we'll have a hot deck up here. Uh, typically, these hot decks will have some kind of plate you can pick up and remove from the top side, and then you'll have all of your fill material, uh, and then you'll have this on either side of the tower. So just you know, get you set up over here. Coming into this deck, there will typically be some form of valve, and a lot of times these these uh, open loops, the valves will actually be up on top. So we'll just use this as our example. We'll have a big old handle sticking out here uh, and then our piping comes in, comes down and ties in and we're spraying water down through a trough into the hot deck trough. And then from here, we've got a lot of no we have nozzle points that are flowing and distributing the water. So the hot deck's purpose and the, the purpose of that trough is to distribute the water flow evenly across the whole cell of the tower to where it doesn't just focus. Because if you allow it, it's going to focus its flow to wherever uh, the valve comes in. So if it comes in right dead center into the middle, then majority of the water is going to flow through that point. And whether it be the air that's coming in or the water that's flowing down, everything's going to take the path of least resistance. So if the, if the middle portion of your fill has heavier water flow than the outer portions, that means the air is going to have an easier time flowing through the outer side of it than the inner. So you'll end up uh, not evenly distributing where your air is flowing through your fill. And the same thing on the water. If we don't properly keep a good water level, and if we're starting to get uh, any kind of low water or trash or anything in the hot deck, then we can end up having too much of our water focus there in the middle or you know the path of least resistance and it's not going to spread out across the whole deck properly but my point behind all of this this valve up here is actually meant to be more of your your flow balancing valve and a lot of times it'll have a dual handle you'll have one handle on the end and you'll have a secondary handle closer in that secondary handle is to be like a lock nut or uh, and it, 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 it's basically just a big old giant wing nut at the end of the day. So with this setup, you do have to take a little more time for tower balancing in addition to just the building balance. The first thing you want to do is you want to balance your building first and foremost. Uh, but once your building, building is balanced, you need to balance how much water is allowed to come into the hot deck as is being taken out of the basin. So if you don't have even coverage on your hot decks, let's just say, let's say the basin is maintaining a proper level, but your hot decks, one is running higher than the other. Well, it's very likely that the one that's not running at a proper level, let's say it's just barely enough to get water all the way across, but we're, we're seeing a lot of vortexes on our nozzles. But on the other side, we've got a really deep level 
of water. Well, in this particular case, I would say that this side on the left would be overfeeding or underfeeding, and the side on the right would be an would be an overfeed. And so it is best to take some time to try to balance those. Now, this is not something you would do on a PM or anything of that nature. It takes time. It takes patience. This is a process to go through when you're going to balance a tower like this. But we do need to, to start to try to take some kind of steps to get the flow more even across here, because part of what will happen is this side that doesn't have very good water flow to begin with compared to the other, the air that the fan is pulling in is going to favor the side with less water flow because there's less restriction in the, in the flow of the entire tower. So even though we're flowing a lot of water over here, we're not getting as much cooling over here because majority of our air is getting pulled in on this side due to its lower resistance. So those are some things we have to think about in the balancing process. And there's, it's a whole, it's an entire system we have to go through. And, and it, does, it does get fairly complicated, or at least in my opinion. You wouldn't think so with as, with as basic as these machines are. It's really just it's water flowing with a fan. But what gets you in trouble is some of the sciences behind flow. Something else that will uh, really trip you up is temperature swings. So water will change its density based off of what temperature it is, it is flowing at. Well, that affects how the water reacts into the GPM that's going to move from one end to the other. So what I've seen happen is I've, I've balanced a loop with minimal to no load on it, and then uh, I turn around and say I do a, a plant startup, for example. I get a load on those towers. So say it would be an open deck example or an open open loop style. And I get a load on it, and now I, I bring my condenser water temperature up because of that load. Well, once that temperature comes up and I start putting that heat actually into the tower and the basin and uh, the hot deck temperatures start to rise, all of a sudden, all the work I put into getting it balanced with no load quickly goes out the window and I start overfeeding and underfeeding on the tower and start pulling the basin down too much. And it, it causes this whole effect, even though inside the building, I don't have any valves changing. I don't have anything changing flow internally. The only thing that changed in the process was my actual tower water temperature, the tower water temperature uh, so as that fluctuated, that affected me. So I do suggest that uh, it's, it's not as easy as that, but I do suggest that if you can balance it, I do a final balance with a load on it and in, in, in a temperature range that it's going to typically maintain at, whether that's 80 degrees, 75 degrees, whatever that temperature is for that loop, uh, try to be as close to that as you can when you start to do a final balance. Now, it doesn't mean you can't do an initial balance or at least try to make some minor tweaks to it, but you're going to, uh, you're, you're going to need to verify that, that balance still maintains true after you get heat into the loop. Now, something else I want to point out that adds to the complications of balancing is as you, let's say we close down the valve over here that's overfeeding and causing this deck to be a little high on water. So as you close this valve down, you're pushing more water naturally over here because ultimately we're not really affecting, or the goal is not to affect the overall loop GPM. Our goal is to balance how we distribute that GPM across the tower. So you start to close this down, you automatically start to rise this level because that means that the, you're going to move a little less water over here. But if this valve is more open, per se, it's going to naturally push more water into this side. So it's not that you need to close this one down and open this one up. It may be as simple as you do a half a turn on the valve on this side of the tower. And that half turn ends up resulting in the balance or close to the balance you're looking for. Anyway went way deeper on balancing than I actually meant to there. Uh, it's, this is not something I recommend just haphazardly doing. You, you really need to have a, a good reason to start messing with tower balancing. Anyway, getting back to some of the startup stuff. So balancing is a part of startup. 
uh, and it just depends on the style of system you have as to how deep you're going to have to go and how well the system was designed. Uh, the piping on the towers also has a big part to play in that because if you're going to run a tower that has two, uh, two decks on it, right? So in this particular case, we have two decks on this open loop. Here's deck one, here's deck two. We need to have the piping perfect you know, as perfectly split as possible. To be honest, I have no idea what that was. I just turned around and y'all are gone. So where did I even leave off? I know I've been talking about balancing. I really need to move on from the balancing thing. I'm spending way too much time on it. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I apologize for that. But uh, here we are. Okay. Uh, so would you, wait, so would you have, or could you balance a closed loop tower since you wouldn't have the hot decks? So Sam, the, this base summary goes back to on a closed loop. If the building is balanced properly, you shouldn't need to do much in terms of balancing the tower itself. Where you really have to focus on balancing uh, really comes into your open loops because of your hot deck scenario. And this is something that has to be done in the field because how the piping is ran and what the conditions of the water and there's a lot of things that play a part into deciding where these manual valves need to be set. Conditions that we don't have on a closed loop because on a closed loop, this basin, this pump, this flow, the entire process in this uh, uh, tower is specifically designed up front. So we, uh, uh, the engineers can have confidence in how they what they choose, why they chose the pump, the process, everything. There's not really anything to do other than make sure it's working properly. Okay, the other side of a startup, if you, if you have an actual control panel. So typically they do have electronic fills and they're becoming very popular. A lot of the towers we're putting in has some kind of electronic fill valve on it. With that fill valve, there will be a sensor uh, that goes into the tower water 
and that has to be filled set. They rarely come pre-installed or preset on the tower. So we have to determine what that basin level is going to be ourselves. And this is true whether it be for closed loop or open loop. So essentially what that what what the sensor is, is nothing more than just a bunch of magnetic rods. Not magnetic. I don't know why I said that. It's just a bunch of rods that stick into the water at different depths. So you'll have your primary common rod, which will be the, the longest one. Uh, that one is telling you, or that one is just the common that everything's going to connect to. And we're using the water in the tower to make the connection uh, for the level controller. So the second longest one is going to be your low water alarm. So when you lose conductivity between the second longest and the longest, it's going to tell the controller, I've got extremely low water. And if it's tied to any kind of a safety for like building automation or an interlock relay, either or, then it's going to be able to shut that sh that tower down and the pump to it. So we don't begin to cavitate or pump water into the, or air into the loop, anything of that nature. A lot of bad stuff can start to happen. Now, the third uh, rod in that process, we're going from longest to shortest. The third rod should be your uh, set point rod. So between the short, between the second and the third, or no, I'm sorry, between the third and the longest, you're, that's when you lose conductivity on the third leg, you're, you need more water. You're below whatever tower level set point you, you set. And that's how you set it is through that third rod's height. And when you get conductivity on that third rod, then the tower is satisfied and you don't, you need to close the solenoid for the electronic fill. Cause that's what it's going to be using instead of a ball and a float, you're going to have an electronic valve. And then the highest, the, the, the shortest rod, the would be the fourth or fifth rod should be fourth rod. The, the shortest one is going to be your high water level. Meaning that when you have conductivity between that one and the longest, your water level has exceeded its nest, its uh, proper value and something is going on. And there's several conditions that can cause that. Now, tying into automation, and we're going to get into a little bit of controls real quick on some controls principles for this. So the automation system uh, can integrate to the level controller and it can have alarm outputs. So the level controllers many times will be able to communicate not data, but like through relays. So if I have a high water or low water condition, I can close this relay and tell the automation system that, hey, uh, I've got this alarm problem. Um, so the automation will do that. The automation a lot of times may manually control the heater. So you may have a temperature sensor telling a controller or a control board, hey, this is my temperature instead of a mechanical thermostat. And uh, then you'll have a contactor in a control panel that can close the heater instead of a mechanical line thermostat like you have in a walk-in cooler or something. It's very basically the exact same technology on a non-control board version. But with a control board, you'll have a thermistor, and that will be what closes a contactor specifically. Now, the fans control... Uh, whether it's a multi-step and a contactor or a, um, a VFD, it's all going to be based off of leaving water temperature. So this is the, the, the water that's leaving is specifically pulling out of the, out of the basin or uh, through the bundle. So that is the water that, that we want to have control of and why we even want to worry about what our leaving water temperature is and what our, uh, what, whether or not we run the fan at maximum or not, because uh, during the summer, it's not an issue. During the, uh, the shoulder seasons or the cooler days, it can become an issue if we overcool the water, because when you overcool, you can create a low ambient condition inside of your equipment, just like you would have if it was outside. So we can't put, you know, 65, 60 degree air into uh, or even 70 degree air into our normal um, uh, refrigeration, you know, air cooled evaporator uh, or air over evaporator uh, on the condenser side because 
we will cause a low ambient condition and will cause the liquid refrigerant to stack. So, and I think I jumbled up my words there. On a normal split system, if you have outside ambient that is about 70 degrees or below, meaning it is colder than a typical return air temperature, then because your condenser, your outdoor section, your heat rejection part becomes colder than your return air on the evaporator, the liquid refrigerant won't naturally move from the condenser, even with a compressor pushing it the same way it, it's supposed to. We need that evaporator input temperature to be lower than our condenser input. So the same way that you can see uh, a frozen coil and um, you begin to, it almost looks like a low charge, except you got a ridiculous subcooling with a low ambient. You can do the same thing with a tower if we let the water get too cold. Um, that's also why on like a water source heat pump loop, we have boilers on those so that as the water source heat pumps are drawing the heat out of the water, we have a boiler put the heat back in the water so they can continue to do their job. Anyway, automation is going to be tied in to that part of the process. So whether we are turning the fan on and off or whether we're, let's say if we're two degrees off from set point and we have a high low fan, then if we're two degrees off, they say we're too warm by two degrees, then we can turn the high speed contactor, engage it, run the fan faster, cool the water down. Let's say we get less than one degree off of set point then we can uh, cycle back over to our low speed contactor and uh, let the fan run at a little bit slower speed to help run a more consistent water instead of having the fan just all the way on, all the way off all the time. The, cool, the VFD, what makes those really optimal is we're able to use that to dial in the fan speed uh, to where it really just kind of hones in in that sweet spot. So it will, uh, it'll just, it'll lock in exactly where you want it to. And whether that's at 30 Hertz, 40 Hertz, 60 Hertz, uh, it's going to kind of dial that in and, and the automation can slowly fluctuate the, the, uh, the drive speed to reject as much heat as we're inputting, because that's ultimately what we're trying to do. We're, the heat we're inputting is coming in through our entering water. And ultimately, we want that drive to run at just the right temperature to where it's going to cool that water down at just the right amount to run whatever uh, set point we have on the water, say that be 80 degrees. That's how we get the most efficiency. We don't try to overwork our fan or our water or pumps or anything else in the process. Uh, okay. Now, there's for tower set points, there's two versions of set points. You have a fixed and you have a variable set point. I personally am a fan of a variable. There's more to it. You have to program it properly. This is from the automation side. Not a lot of uh, automation techs necessarily know how to program that right. Um, so that is a limitation. But so a fixed, a fixed is just simple as I want 80 degree condenser water no matter what. An issue with that is you're restricted by wet bulb. So you can only cool the water down as much as your wet bulb temperature is. And most cooling towers have a approach, just like a chiller and, and really any, any heat exchanger, there's gonna be an approach value. So the approach is calculated on the tower by taking your wet bulb temperature. And most modern towers are somewhere between uh, three to five degrees of, um, of approach. Now, a lot of your older towers can be as much as seven degrees. What that means is that you're only going to be able to cool the water per design with a load on the tower to say five degrees of whatever the wet bulb temperature is. So if we have a wet bulb temperature of let's say uh, 75 outside, due to hum high humidity, for example. Well, then the best condenser water we'll be able to achieve is 80 degrees with that tower. 
uh, if our wet bulb temperature was, say, 80, 85 out, the best you're going to be able to do at 80 degrees wet bulb is 85 degrees leaving the tower. And there's nothing, that's not the tower's fault. That is just the, the maximum efficiency that that tower is capable of. All right, if you can hear me, just hang on a second. I got to see it happen this time. That should be, I, I, I caught it this time. I apologize, everybody. Okay. I had to make an adjustment to the camera. Hopefully that stops. It's having an issue. All right. So we're talking wet bulbs. Yes, the, the most you can cool is based off of uh, whatever your wet bulb is. So just bear that in mind. Uh, just like anything, we can only, we have limitations on what we can do. Uh, Sorry, my camera is, we'll be fine. So, um, with a variable, the variable side where that becomes beneficial is we have, uh, we can base our set point off of whatever the ambient is. Now we can still put a limit on it. So for example, in many conditions, um, we may be able to run our condenser water, say, down to 75 degrees. Or if we have a, if you're on a chiller uh, loop, you know, you may be able to get down to into the, uh, to 70. Uh, with a York, you can push that as far as 60 degrees. Ultimately, what we're doing is we're just allowing colder water, which reduces our condenser pressures, and we make the chiller more efficient, which is cheaper than paying, um, than, than uh, if trying to reduce load on our fan. So anyway, um, we would create, we would, the automation system would create an algorithm to where basically if our outside humidity gets below this value or we will have an offset of our set point is within five degrees of wet bulb outside. So as our wet bulb drops, we can drop our set point but we can also put a limit in there to where it's not allowed to go, to move the set point above, say, 80 or 85. So once we get up to 85 set point, even if our wet bulb continues to rise outside, we're still going to maintain an 85 to force that fan to run at 100% no matter what. So there's there's things like that we can do that will make uh, that help. It's just efficiency. It's all about getting the most efficiency and providing the unit with as with as uh, with what it's wanting or needing or asking for as much as we can. All right, spent a whole lot of time on that. Let's go through some quick troubleshooting uh, steps. So let's say we have a high temperature issue. Some of the first things we ought to be looking at is uh, is your fan working? Is it working properly? Uh, do you have multiple fans in the tower or are all the fans up and running? Is only some of the fans running? Uh, are you running them at high speed? Let's say you've got a situation where it's got a low speed, high speed. Is it stuck in low speed, for example? Uh, what is your actual set point compared to what is wet bulb? So you'll have some extremely high humidity days at times and uh, your wet bulb goes up because of the, you know that's that's what re wet bulb is is uh, communicating is what the uh, humidity level is on the system. So we're in the building. 
not the building, the outside air. The wet bulb is telling you what the humidity is outside, whether you're using wet bulb or relative humidity. Anyway, um, if your uh, wet bulb is high, that's going to affect your what water you're looking for. So, so if a customer is wanting a 75-degree condenser water, but you've got a 75-degree wet bulb outside, I'm sorry, but it's just not going to happen. Uh, flow. So if you have really high flow through the tower, specifically, this would be more of a closed loop scenario. Say you've got really high flow. Your uh, excessive flow is not going to let that water sit in the tower long enough to cool down. But if you have excessive flow at the tower, or even say you have low flow, uh, so if you've got low flow through your equipment inside the building, uh, you know, that's going to cause the building to put more heat into the, the loop because it's going to elevate all your condenser pressures. So because the whole system is, is running a lower uh, overall GPM and it needs more, you know, those are the things that uh, can cause an excessive uh, water temperature. So you really need to evaluate what your building flow is doing at that stage. So if you believe your, uh, your high water temperatures or even low water are due to a flow condition, then you need to evaluate the flow condition on the building and your, co your, your call is going to come in, like service call is going to come in as a, I've got a cooling tower issue. But that's part of what you're having to think about is, you know, that cooling tower is running the entire building. So they may be having an issue on the building, but they think it's an issue with the cooling tower, whether that be the automation, whether that be the building pumps, something of that nature. So you've now got to show up, do a base evaluation on the tower, think you, there's something going wrong with the flow itself, and then dive in deeper into the building side to evaluate that. Uh, you could also be a uh, a water level issue. You know, if you start running too low of water levels in your basin, whether that be either side, uh, closed or open loop, that's going to hurt your ability to cool the overall system. So wherever your outlet is on the tower, you want to make sure that you've got a solid foot or better, uh, at minimum six inches, because even six inches can be a little shy above whatever the the, uh, the the top of the basin outlet is. And one thing you can look for is, can you see any kind of vortexing coming into the basin? So when you see the, which a vortex is just, it's just a water current, just a type of current where, you know, a little spiral thing you see in the cartoons growing up or whatever. Uh, those vortexes can indicate to you that there's too much velocity flowing on that water right there. And that velocity uh, is being, is allowed to be there because of the lower water level. So if you were to raise the water level in that tower some, get that vortex to stop, because that vortex is also allowing air to get pulled in, by the way. So that means all your high points are going to start having air collect in them. So if you're running a low water level in your basin, you're constantly vortexing, you're going to start having condenser water issues, and you're going to start having air in the loop issues uh, because, of, because of that. You know, it's going to start cause, causing your, your condenser water temperatures to also elevate, and you're going to have trouble maintaining and keeping up. So get some more water into that basin. Or they may have a bypass. So... A lot of buildings, especially ones that have a boiler attached, if they're using it for a heat pump loop, or even if it's, uh, if it's just a regular loop, but they have a bypass on it for low ambient control. So uh, instead of, because that's really common on open loops, they'll run a bypass uh, so that, because uh, even without the fan running on an open loop, you're still cooling just by having that water flow down across the fill. So by bypassing the tower altogether, the water is not flowing over the fill directly. Uh, that is going to allow you to uh, 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 
the bypass is going to allow that to stop from happening. So you're not continuing to cool that water because I've seen that just the flow alone with no fan can be enough to overcool a loop on a shoulder day. So the bypass keeps that water in the loop and keeps your head pressures up without allowing them to drop into a low ambient state if that's something you're struggling with. Or let's say you've got a uh, half of your water source heat pumps are in cooling, half are in heating. You don't need the boiler, but you also don't need the tower. So the bypass allows you to, to balance that. Or the bypass, if you have a boiler, you know, you'll close the bypass on the tower or open, sorry, you'll open the bypass on the tower, allow everything to flow just to the boiler. And, uh, you know, anyway, but if that fails, if they get stuck, if something happens to that, then you end up where you're not properly moving water through the tower, which means you're not going to cool it properly, which is going to elevate those temperatures as well. So make sure that you're, uh, you're allowing, uh, you're checking the bypass if they have one and that it's not leaking by, bypassing by. Sometimes the actuators fail on them and they won't close all the way. Some fairly common issues. Uh, Let's see. And the spray nozzles. So whether it be the spray nozzles or the bundles, uh, these little nozzles up here on, on the bottom of the hot deck, or you'll have little sprayer heads. They look like a weird looking sprinkler head, or actually they look exactly like the fire sprinkler heads you see sticking down, except these will be typically like a larger version and be, be plastic instead of the metal. Either way, uh, these heads can get plugged up or you'll have this little armature that hangs down. So let's say this is the nozzle head sticking out of your header pipe. There'll be this little plastic armature with a fan that you're, it'll be kind of fanned out and, and sprawled. So the water hits it in the center and then it distributes it over a general area. Well, these right here, these little, uh, the spreaders, sprinkler piece of it, will break off and this just turns into a jet stream shooting straight down into the basin. And you're lucky if it's hitting a pipe to begin with. So when you have those, you need to replace them. Uh, so if you have too many of those that break or these little ports in here where the water's flowing, you know, trash, it gets in this basin, gets moved up through the, into the header pipe. And then it's able to sit in here and it, a bunch of leaves start to plug up these ports, for example. Well, that's going to stop the flow. So you, you'll get up there. This, these are things to check for in maintenance is uh, there will be nothing coming out of them. Now, what I like to do is take a piece of a um, uh, uh, brazing rod or you, you can carry a clothes hanger, something of that nature. Uh, you can stick in there and poke it around long enough. You'll get that to clear out and clear through there. Uh, and you have to be kind of careful because sometimes these can be in fairly precarious spots. So they may be a little challenging to get to, but typically they're accessible to some degree. Or you may have a, um, you may have a, a separate set of, uh, it's not truly fill, even though it's made of fill material. It's more of air uh, diffusers up in the top and then you'll have to pull those diffusers out to get to the sprayer deck below that and then below the sprayer deck is your actual fill deck either way there's several tower designs make sure that your nozzles are properly flowing that can that will not put water across the bundle properly so if we're not spreading water across the bundle then we're not going to be cooling the bundle down as it needs to and uh, that's going to cause excessive water temperatures or the bundle could just be dirty. And the same thing on these louvers. You know, as the louvers get dirty, that's gonna impact how much the water can flow, how it can flow, scale builds up in there, scale builds up on the bundles. All that scale is affecting heat exchange. It's also affecting flow and how that flow can get distributed. So that's why all that has to be cleared out and cleaned out to allow proper flow and clean heat exchange. Uh, so if you've got a tower that hasn't been serviced or maybe they've got really hard water for some reason, 
and or the chemical treatments not doing their job effectively, who knows why? You've got heavy buildup. They need to address that, and that's going to be that's going to have a heavy part to play into your ability to cool that water down. Okay, well, because I decided to spend a whole lot of time talking about balancing that I really didn't plan on, uh, I did not finish going through the rest of the. Uh, the rest of what I had. So I wanted to talk about how the water levels could affect things or how to troubleshoot water level issues a little deeper. I also wanted to get into some heat exchangers and economizers a little more. So what we may do is in two weeks when we have our next class, uh, we may I may structure that more around uh, troubleshooting and talking less about maybe some of the principles. I feel like I spent quite a bit of this one really diving into some 101. Um, and I didn't get to dive into the actual uh, troubleshooting as much as I, I thought I'd make my, my time for. Either way, uh, final questions. Let's throw them in there. Um, let's get final questions in. Hey, if you're moving to Austin, you know, uh, air performance or APS, uh, APS-CentralTX.com, there should be a join us button, send in your resume. Granted, I'm backed up on trying to review resumes, so uh, there is that. But ultimately, HR, they do a good job on keeping a good whip on me. So I'll, we'll get to those. Uh, we are hiring. Uh, let's see, kind of skimming through, skimming through the uh, comments here, see if anything stands out to me. Uh, I do apologize for the technical difficulties. I did get a different camera not too far back, and it's I'm still learning the camera, uh, but I know what I did to mess up on this one. So it was I had a parameter I needed to change, so it's technically my fault. Uh, so in addition to the basin fill, it is typical to have a low basin water level safety switch of some kind that interlocks to the pump, auto start stop to prevent air from entering the loop. Uh, oh, is it? That's actually a question. Yeah, it, some towers have it. I also forgot to mention vibration uh, switches. We'll get into that uh, next class. I'll save that for that. But uh, some towers have it. I do find that a lot of towers, especially if it's a more budget uh, conscious um, account, they tend to not have that as a standard. Um, yeah, they'll, they won't have any kind of low water safety at all. Just that basin will run itself dry. And short of somebody walking out there or the, the building just losing the load, they, they probably wouldn't even know. Um, but it is a fantastic addition. You can do that. And as you're talking about, you can set up, a, like say it's, it doesn't have a control system at all, you can just set up a mechanical float switch, very similar to what you would use on like a condensate, a secondary pan switch or something like that. So it'd be very, it'd basically be the same thing except for low water. So when the switch opens, uh, that could be interlocked or, or tied in series with your pump starter contacts or the pump starter safety. Uh, which is going to drop your pump out if it sees water level get too low. It is a fantastic thing to have. will save your pump, your building, save you a lot of trouble if the customer is willing to do it. Ah, thank you, Sterling. Actually, I felt like I went through. Uh, I went through that not as I planned. Uh, all right. I'm going to call it. See y'all guys. Appreciate everybody. See you in two weeks for more training and we'll, we'll continue the tower thing. Um, honestly, I thought I'd move through this a little quicker and I did. I didn't. Now we know. Appreciate everybody.